Good evening. Um, uh, good evening from here. Um, good whatever time of day it is, wherever you're joining us from. Um, thanks for joining us this evening. This is our first Lacana Scotland event of the new academic year. Um, we have a fairly exciting, a fairly, we have a very exciting programme of events um, for the year ahead. Um, we have um, Brett Fibiani joining us in October to give a presentation. We have Bracha Ettinger joining us in November. And we have um, more exciting speakers for after the new year. And you can check out on our website the details of those um, as and when we post them. Um, but tonight, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Fabio Vigi um, to present for Lacan in Scotland. I've known Fabio for quite a number of years and have always been very impressed with his um, incisive use of Lacanian theory and philosophy in looking at um, issues of, of politics and particularly issues of capitalism and anti-capitalism. And I've been, uh, I've seen Fabio present a number of times and I've followed his written work um, and it's of a, an unparalleled standard of incision. And I came across Fabio's work in relation to COVID and the pandemic fairly recently and um, was um, blown away and equally unsurprised, unsurprised because I'm familiar with Fabio's work and really there should have been no surprise there that Fabio was producing this very, very incisive, um, cutting, perceptive work in relation to what's been going on in terms of COVID-19 and the various ramifications of COVID-19, the pandemic, lockdowns, etc. Um, with a particular emphasis on the discourses that surround this. Um, so I asked Fabio to come along and talk with, talk with us tonight. I think the things he has to say, the observations he has are very important. They're not only important, they are um, not quite a lone voice, but close to a lone voice. I've been struck over the last 18 months with the lack of critical engagement, um, critical engagement from the Lacanian field, critical engagement from the left. Um, with what's going on with COVID-19. So it's really refreshing to read someone who marries those two things, that um, that theoretical um, insight and the power that that can bring to an argument, but the desire to actually critically engage with what's going on right now. Um, so it's an enormous pleasure to um, have Fabio here tonight. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Fabio. Hey, thank you, Callum. That's um, really kind, kind words from you. I um, hope I live up to the picture you've painted. And uh, I'll start straight away. Um, hope you can hear me fine. Let me know if you don't, and uh, I'll, I'll adjust. But um, if it's okay, um, I, I this talk is kind of informed by um, an essay that uh, uh, on political on the political economy of COVID that I wrote uh, a few months ago. Right, and that um, has gained quite a bit of attention uh, on the web and sparked quite a lot of debate, uh, uh, which uh, I must admit surprised me a little bit, but um, uh, here we are. I just want to try and uh, connect uh, the argument on the political economy of COVID that I developed in that piece with uh, Lacanian discourse theory. So to try and, um, not an easy thing to do, admittedly, but um, trying to see where we can situate uh, COVID as a um, discourse, right? Um, which perhaps is a discourse that is morphing all the time, changing, uh, morphing maybe into something else that we're not, you're not yet aware of. Uh, perhaps a new discourse. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'm particularly struck by um, uh, an expression Lacan used in um, Science and Truth, which is that of successful paranoia. So one of the links I will make towards the end of the paper is between COVID and successful paranoia as understood by Lacan in Science and Truth, which is a bit anecdotal, but um, hopefully we can uh, you know, follow that with a discussion, right? Because I think that's an open um, conclusion in many ways and a very kind of speculative one, but you know. So I'd rather, uh, I'd like to introduce my talk with a brief quotation, right, from an email that I received today from somebody that I didn't know, a psychoanalyst, got in touch with me um, about my paper, my um, article on COVID and, uh, and, and the economy. 
and wrote uh, to me, as a psychoanalyst, I know hypnosis when I see it. I cannot support anyone who uses hypnosis on people without their consent. Throughout human history, the idea of moral goodness has been used as a hypnotic weapon against the people. Control the definition of what is good using mechanisms of shame and guilt, and you control the behavior of every neurotic who wants to be good. It's the oldest trick in the book. End of quote. So when I read this, uh, it kind of immediately resonated with um, this notion of successful paranoia, the fact that we might be caught in some kind of successful paranoia, right? As something that requires us to live in a state of denial, maybe, or, uh, you know, or collective hypnosis even, right? Maybe we can use that uh, term again. So, um, okay, we'll get to that again, maybe at the end. But the starting point for me um, uh, is that we should place COVID within the capitalist discourse, first of all, right? Um, which was, as you know, presented by Lacan in between the late 60s and early 1970s. Um, and in, in 2020, I sort of realized that uh, to understand COVID, you need to follow the money, right? to put it simply, right? I think to get a full, full picture of what's going on with COVID is the best thing to do is to follow the money. Um, so it's not really primarily, I would say, about government, not about medicine, not necessarily about microbiology or, you know, bats, labs, or even eugenics. Um, um, arguably, this is all part of it, right? This is all part of what COVID is, but fundamentally, the economy for me is the COVID driver. Um, and we could say that conversely, um, COVID is an economic driver, uh, maybe the only real economic driver we have today. And by economy, I refer to political economy in the same way as Marx understood it as a sort of totalizing social relation, which is also the way Lacan understood it, right, as a discourse or a social bond when he spoke of the capitalist discourse. So the first step is for me to think beyond the hopelessly limited sort of conceptualization of economy as a kind of superficial set of conditions, like we get in marginal utility theory or whatever is taught in mainstream economics today. And, you know, let's be clear about this. Capitalist economy is a deep structural social formation that as such really is anchored in the unconscious, right? So there's, there's a strong relationship there with uh, psychoanalysis, I think. Um, with capitalist discourse, I'm referring to Lacan's infamous fifth discourse, which I'm sure you're familiar with, right? It was presented um, sketchily um, in, in some texts of the early 70s, like the Milan talk uh, of May 1972, uh, but it's also developed in his seminars, uh, starting from seminar 16, also seminar 17, and partly se seminar 18 too. So when people say, oh, but, uh, you know, uh, like I never really expanded, never really said anything meaningful about the capitalist discourse, I tend to think, hang on a second, in, in, in those seminars of the late 1960s, he said quite a lot about, about capitalism, right? Uh, some illuminating references to capitalism and its critique. So um, what I, first thing I want to do is try and pick out some, uh, pick out some key points uh, made by Lacan in, in, in relation to the capitalist discourse without necessarily getting into the algebra, right? Because I think that would make it too abstract. Um, the thing that, that, that I think is important for me is that um, capitalism for Lacan constitutes um, a kind of new type of insidious mastery, right? It, call, it calls it um, an, an, a new master. Um, why insidious? Because uh, the master signifier, if you think of the, briefly of the algebra, right? I don't want to but the master signifier S1 slips underground, goes to occupy the place of the unconscious truth of the discourse. And um, this truth is also made available to the subject, of course, who believes that they know what they want fundamentally, right? They know, and, and in fact, in the, in the, in the, in the schema in, in, in uh, Lacan's algebra, there's actually a vector going down, right? And that's the novelty of it. Uh, 
the difference with the other discourses. So the unconscious, in a sense, can be consumed, right? Can be enjoyed. Um, I don't know, like a pair of shoes we buy or a, a McDonald's meal. So it is legitimate in a way to argue that the capitalist discourse is a discourse that aims to be without discourse, a kind of flat ontology without breaks, without ruptures, um, precisely because, and Lacan is, is quite uh, clear about it, because it aims ultimately to foreclose the unconscious, right? Which is the source of all um, inconsistencies, all discursive inconsistencies and, and therefore also discursive transformations. So um, Lacan argues um, that, especially in seminar 16, um, you know, the cleverness of this course lies in the fact that it turns uh, surplus jouissance into surplus value, right? And I think I read that as uh, meaning that the discourse valorizes, economically valorizes the unconscious uh, surplus jouissance. So it turns it into a valorized, valorized surplus, which is then the engine of the discourse, right? So I think, you know, that's uh, uh, one important point to make, that it, it tends to kind of hide or conceal the presence of, of, of the unconscious by valorizing it, mm -hmm. by turning it into, a, into surplus value. Um, but I want the point I really want to stress is that um, in, in the capitalist discourse, mastery, right, I can't call it the new master, works by vanishing. So by making itself invisible. So everything seems to make sense, to function in a kind of spontaneous way, right? As if no one was really at the helm of the discourse. As if no one was giving orders and no one was obeying orders. Right? As if everyone was simply following their desires to work, to consume, to be happy or to be unhappy, uh, to make money, whatever. So I think what matters is the invisibility of the master signifier that Lacan really underlines. There's a wonderful passage in Seminar 17 that I think sums it up. Lacan writes or says, what is striking and what no one seems to see is that by virtue of the fact that the clouds of impotence have been aired, the master signifier only appears even more unassailable, unassailable, right? Unassailable. Where is it? How can it be named? How can it be located? Other than through its murderous effects, of course. Denounce imperialism, but how can this little mechanism be stopped? Right? So Lacan underlined the fact that the master in capitalism becomes unlocatable and therefore very difficult to, um, to counter because it's nowhere to be seen fundamentally, right? Um, and, and I think this passage, when I reread it, I thought, okay, doesn't this passage make like kind of, kind of conspiracy theorist, right? It's basically saying that capitalist power works from a position of secrecy, hmm? a position of invisibility, almost, right? So immediately I thought, okay, how can any Lacanian really believe that power doesn't conspire? Power has always conspired, has always schemed, has always plotted, has always manipulated the masses, right, as far as I'm concerned. And, and, it does if, and, and it does that even better now, precisely because it operates from this position of invisibility, right? It's, it's from secrecy. No one can really see it, point its finger at it. Um, so the term conspiracy, I would say, it really should be first and foremost attributed to power. Power conspires. And then also theorists, of course, but power is, power is, is conspiratorial. So um, I've, I've heard many Lacanians kind of accusing others of being conspiracy theorists, normally by quoting Lacan's motto that there is no such thing as a, as a big other, right? Um, meaning that no one really is in charge, right? There's no such thing as a big other. The big other is empty, is inconsistent. So, you know, there's no point being conspiracy theorist here. There's no, there's no point because ultimately it's empty. Power is ontologically inconsistent and so on, right? 
I agree on the ultimate inconsistency of power, but maybe there is another side to this, right? Precisely because there is no big other, precisely because there is no big other, power operates by occupying the gap or inconsistency in the other. So it's precisely the ontological inconsistency of the big other that allows those in power to conspire and control people by occupying the inconsistency of the, of the other, right? So that's, that's a key point, I think, right, to make. And, um, and, and furthermore, the clinic of neurosis shows us again and again the extent to which uh, the average neurotic wants to believe in the big other, right, quite desperately. Every neurotic is desperate to believe in the big other to the point that he or she may even turn to, into a pervert, you know, right? In other words, functioning as the very fetish that makes the other exist, you know, that, that fills the gap in the other and therefore gives the other some consistency. So I think this neurosis, which verges on perversion, is common, I would like, you know, maybe, yeah, to, to kind of... Um, argue that uh, it's common to all those, even those leftists like Zizek in many ways, who continue to accept, for example, the, the, the kind of, uh, many ways, fraudulent uh, official versions of events like 9-11 and COVID, right? The official versions. There's almost like a desperate need, a desperate necessity to believe in the big other and its official narrative, right? Of course, there are, most, most conspiracy theories are completely crazy and wacky, but, but generally, I would argue that they are crazy because they stop too soon, right, in the search for the culprit, not because they believe that there is a conspiracy, right? Power conspires by definition. So as far as I'm concerned, in, in our case, the real conspirator is capitalist power, of course, embodied, embodied by those who, you know, if we follow Marx's uh, vocabulary, we would call the functionaries of capital, those who represent it, those physical embodiments of, of, of capital as a, as a discourse. But the fact that the capitalist discourse um, conspires seems to me obvious. So let's go back to uh, Lacan's key point. While the traditional master relies on symbolic authority, right? This was of the master, phallic authority, symbolic authority. The capitalist master functions by disavowing such authority. In a way, delegating it to the impersonal, intangible, invisible objectivity of the discourse. Authority, authority is relinquished, by, but si simultaneously reasserted precisely in its relinquished form. And Lacan's point is that this stratagem, this pretense, this pretense that there is no ruling authority, opens up the space for the secret and kind of deeper manipulation uh, of those who are almost hypnotized, right? Because they can't locate the source of this manipulation. Power is all of a sudden intangible and invisible. So I think this premise uh, is necessary if we are to contextualize COVID as a, as a monetary event. And I, I'm, I'm gonna move on to my, my next point now, right? So to think of COVID uh, in, in, in fundamentally as a capitalist event, um, but more precisely as a monetary event, so a financial event even, right? So in a sense, here comes my uh, conspiracy theory, right? This is not really a conspiracy theory, but that's probably <laughs> how it's going to be read. Um, uh, so, uh, to grasp how COVID is uh, a creature of capital, I would say, right? We need to think of, of, of capitalism almost in a kind of Darwinian evolutionary sense. It is only interested in extending its discourse, right? Capitalism, uh, you know, whichever way it can. And I would say it's not even going to stop at anything, right? In order to extend the possibilities of its discourse. Um, so, in a sense, the crisis uh, triggered by COVID is capitalism's most daring attempt yet to reproduce its own logic 
at a higher level of, I would say, technological complexity uh, and through different forms of mastery, maybe engaging different forms of mastery. Okay, so it's not like, uh, I think Zizek uh, wrote a couple of books on the pandemic, so instant books on the pandemic, when he wrote that, um, you know, this is a, a mortal blow to capitalism. Like COVID is a mortal blow to capitalism. He quoted Tarantino, blah, blah, blah. Right, he made it clear. And I think it's the opposite in a sense, right? It's not a mortal blow to capitalism, but it's what allows capitalism to, re to kind of self-revolutionize once again, to reproduce its own logic in a, in a different, even in a different discursive framework. So let's see how, let's see why I, I, I claim that. I, I think that, first of all, in, in mid-September 2019, I think we need to go back to pre-COVID times, right? At that time, the financial markets were about to crash. Nobody seems to remember that, but they were about to crash due to a liquidity trap in a specific place called the repo market, right? Repo is is shorthand for repurchase agreement. It's a huge reservoir of cheap of cheap loans, basically backed by collateral by securities, right? So it's a it's a, a pool of cheap loans used by banks to finance their investment. Uh, fundamentally, they're betting in other markets. And what happened in September 2019 is that um, the repo interest rates went up from two percent to 10.5 percent in a matter of hours which caused panic among traders, uh, affected futures, options, currencies, and other markets where traders bet by borrowing from the repo market, right? So something needed to be done very quickly to stop this contagion, kind of financial contagion. Um, we're not talking about the virus yet, right? It's financial contagion. So just to put it into perspective, a contagion of the magnitude that was developing in the financial market in September, 2019, uh, would have made the, the kind of credit crunch of 2008 look like a walk in the park, right? Something huge. Uh, this is because it would have hit transactions on the ground, businesses in the real economy, pensions, savings, mortgages, and so on. Since everything, as we know, runs on credit. Uh, so everything, even in the real economy, depends on borrowing, right? So it depends on what, on, 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 the, on the availability of money, of money uh, in the banks and therefore in the financial sector. What happened there was interesting. The Federal Reserve, Americans at the US Central Bank reacted very quickly, spectacularly even, right? How, how did it react? It reacted by creating billions of dollars on a weekly basis, out of nowhere, right? Through a few clicks of a computer mouse. And it injected that astronomical mass of cash, virtual cash, into the financial system by buying securities as it normally does with, with quantitative easing, right? So that, you know, so they started an, an unprecedented operation of, of monetary stimulus. It's like quantitative easing on steroids, basically, right? Effectively pl uh, plugging the, the holes and the cracks in the financial sector, right? And they kept doing it. They had to keep doing it because the damage was huge and they had to repair it, right? Something similar is happening in China today, incidentally, right? With Evergrande's uh, a failure. So we, we get a, the, the kind of same narrative, not only in, in, in the States, but also in, in China with, with their own central bank, the People's Bank of China, uh, basically bailing out uh, uh, Evergrande, which is the you know, huge corporation in, um, in, in real estate, you know, real estate developer, huge corporation. Um, so the other interesting thing on top of that is that the, 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 the Federal Reserve, together with other actors, knew that this uh, repocalypse, as it was called, right, uh, was coming already in the summer of 2019. They knew they had, you know, there are documents that I've, I've quoted from that are referenced in my piece where you can see how the Fed, the Federal Reserve, uh, the Bank of International Settlements, which is the, one of the most powerful you know, the so-called central bank of, of all central banks uh, in, in Switzerland, um, and especially BlackRock, right? The most powerful investment fund in the world. Now, these people were discussing literally how to deal what, with what they, what they called in those papers in the summer of 2019, the coming downturn, right? And there were 
they were saying, they were, they were discussing, again in inverted commas, how to insulate the real economy. How to insulate the real economy from the downturn in the financial sector that was coming, right? So there is a lot of evidence. I would say evidence hidden in plain sight almost, right? Suggesting a relationship of causality between finance and COVID. COVID as a global health emergency, right? And, and by extension between contemporary capitalism and its discourse and COVID. I'm talking about a kind of inverted causality, right? Not COVID causing financial crisis, as, as we were told, but the opposite, right? Financial crisis, the repo market uh, collapsing in 2019, causing or triggering this global health emergency called COVID, right? My friend Todd Smith calls this the flunantial crisis, right? A, a pun that I'm sure would have uh, made even Lacan giggle a little, perhaps, right? A flunantial crisis. So brief recap, we have a major incident in the financial sector. We have the Fed following BlackRock's advice, pumping freshly printed cash by the cartload into, into Wall Street to prevent contagion from spreading. A couple of months later, we get COVID. And therefore, we get lockdowns, restrictions, essentially the freezing of the real economy, right? The idea be here is that the real economy is put into a kind of induced coma. Why? Because lockdowns and the global suspension of economic transactions allowed the Fed to continue to flood the ailing financial markets with computer money, while avoiding or rather postponing the problem of hyperinflation, which would be and is the logical consequence of this massive monetary expansion, right? So I think what we need to understand is that you know, the only way for, for, for them to, to diffuse contagion and therefore global chaos, right? Because contagion of, of this caliber would mean global chaos was by, throw, by throwing as much liquidity as necessary into the financial system whilst making sure that all that cash remained uh, uh, frozen inside Wall Street, right? Didn't reach Main Street because that would have caused the disaster. So the injection of this sublime mass of money, right? Sublime in the Kantian sense of unimaginable, right? We're talking about trillions uh, uh, of, of, of dollars, right? So a huge amount of money um, was only possible by turning the engine of Main Street off. Like when we turn the car engine off before we repair it, right? And the reason for this is that switching off the economy drained the demand for credit and therefore stopped the contagion, right? Like imagine you're, you're, you're bitten by a poisonous snake and the first thing you have to do is to try and stop the circulation of blood as it contains poison, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have to reach the heart or whatever. So, um, you know, fr from the point of view of, 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 cap of the capitalist discourse, right? Or, or we could say from the sh short-sighted capitalist mall, there was no alternative. Virtual money created as digital bytes of this amount of money cannot be allowed to cascade into or onto uh, economic cycles on the ground, as this would provoke hyperinflation, a kind of tsunami similar to Weimar 1920s or Zimbabwe more recently or Argentina, uh, only much more catastrophic because, you know, uh, it would hit a global interconnected economy where every, the financial markets are all interconnected, right? And, uh, and on top of that, also a stagnant economy. So my conclusion with all this is that uh, the sorting out of the financial mess of, the, of, of uh, no, financial mess of this magnitude could only take place under the cover of a pandemic, which made sure that the circulation of money, in other words, debt, could be slowed down or controlled, like you control the water coming out of a tap. And this fundamental issue was ignored or rejected by most commentators, including progressive or radical leftists. Maybe it's because, I thought to myself, most leftists today have reneged on the Marxian critique of political economy, which Lacan himself, to his credit, uh, engaged with, right, in those seminars of the late 1960s, despite being a conser you know, conservative. Uh, or maybe because today's discourse works by denial. Mm, uh, a kind of moral blackmail 
that has a sort of hypnotic effect on people and prevent them to raise issues which are central. Um, you know, most people I talked to thought that the shutting down of the economy, right, in relation to COVID was intrinsically detrimental to capitalism as it, as it hampers consumption and therefore profits, right? That's the kind of logical argument to have. But to me, it seems like it's exactly the opposite, right? The economy had to be turned off to avoid the capitalist Armageddon, you know, the explosion of the whole house of cards. So that was capitalism's clever, as it, you know, if you like, solution. And what COVID ultimately makes visible, I think, is that, uh, you know, contemporary capitalism can only survive as a discourse, right? I'm still thinking in terms of Lacan's discourse, um, through emergencies, mm -hmm. through global emergencies, and um, because of those emergencies, by turning uh, more and more authoritarian, ultimately, right? That's what we're seeing today, I think. Um, in, that, in that respect, maybe we can argue that COVID is um, kind of maybe a propaganda masterpiece even, right? Which was dictated, masterminded and, and executed uh, by the capitalist discourse itself, right? And we're talking about once again, the fact that it's emergency capitalism at its purest, right? Even at its more cynical, we could say, on top of that. So um, today, just to finish off with this uh, uh, bit of the argument, we can say that, that uh, you know, COVID continues to come in handy. Uh, and, you know, initially it served to insulate the economy, the real economy. More recently, it has um, um, overseen its tentative reopening, as we know, right? Which is characterized by variants, right? So iterations of, of virus, fundamentally, of the same virus. Um, variants, submissions to uh, the vaccination uh, program, uh, the COVID pass and other biotechnological methods, etc. So, you know, in, in, 20, in, in 2021, the, the health crisis uh, started looking like a kind of roller coaster with, with partial openings alternating with new closures uh, due to mini waves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Almost like a global, I would say, role play where uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we have actors simply passing the buck to make sure that the emergency goes continues, um, continues to circulate, and 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 at least somewhere in the world. Like I'm thinking of Australia today, for example, in New Zealand. You know, you, I'm sure you've seen footage from from Australia, what's going on there, but also in the U.S. and also uh, in, in Europe, in Italy and France. Right? We, we we have some incredibly draconian measures that have been implemented there in terms of COVID pass and uh, and work. All right? We know that. You can work only if you have a COVID pass. In other words, only if you've been vaccinated. Otherwise, you're you're completely cut out of society, right? Quite literally. Um, and I think ultimately the reason for this is that without virus, uh, our senile, our, our our type of sort of senile kind of finance driven and and finance addicted uh, form of capitalism would collapse, right? So I'm, I'm, so we need emergencies so that. Uh, uh, um, we can keep with going with the same routine of money printing, uh, uh, zero interest rates, and uh, inflation of, of financial assets, et cetera, et cetera, right? But what we're seeing today is also the effects of that, because the moment you open the economy or, or you know, part of the economy, um, um, the, the kind of the opening of the kind of credit-based transactions in the real economy inevitably causes inflation to rise. Right, more money circulating more quickly, and inflation immediately rises, and that's exactly what we are witnessing today. Uh, and, and rising inflation means also impoverishment of, of, of workers, right, of people. Mm. You know, we know that. Um, so, um, you know, as soon as this kind of astronomical amount of money created by central bankers and their magic wand, you know, which is essentially debt, uh, begins to circulate again. Uh, inflation, which is not uh, which is not transitional, as they told us it, it, today, it doesn't look transitional at all. Immediately goes up. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, the turbo capital of the transnational elites um, continues to expand in the financial orbit, um, while also absorbing, picking up the pieces of those businesses 
uh, that it has depressed and and uh, destroyed in many cases, right? So that's, I think, where, where we are today. We are in this kind of perpetual state of emergency that, you know, seems to characterize contemporary societies, especially since 9-11, I would say, right? And, and it's allowing, right, I would say, the kind of controlled demolition of what we call the real economy and even of um, liberal democratic uh, societies, you know, slow demolition, right? We're talking about something slow, like, um, you know, in, um, in um, uh, Noam Chomsky's famous anecdote of the frog, right? If you throw a frog into a, into a pot of boiling water, the frog comes out straight away. But if you put it in, in, in some kind of lukewarm water and then you raise the temperature little by little, the frog is you know, having a good time, having a good swim, but you know, sooner or later, um, sooner uh, the frog dies. Mm? It's, it's, uh, so I think in a sense we are, we are in a similar um, situation today and um, it looks as if uh, there's no way out of this, right? It's, it's very difficult to think of a, of, of a way out of this, of this deadlock, mm? which, which in a sense looks more and more like a kind of cash 22 situation, because on the one hand, we, we have inflation rising the moment we open the economy, right? The reopening of the economy means that most money, uh, more money is circulating and therefore um, the infl inflation, inflation grows. But at the same time, central banks need to tame inflation, right? They know that they cannot let inflation run away. And they can only do that by deflating the economy, right? So we get this crazy mechanism whereby we get inflation, but also the, the, the deflation by draining credit. So by making sure that not too much credit reaches somehow uh, the economy, right? They need to contain the disruptive effects of excessive money creation, which is what has characterized um, our time, especially from September 2019 with the crisis of the repo market. Um, so most of us literally end up uh, between a rock and a hard place, right? Squashed between price inflation of essential goods and the kind of deflationary liquidity drainage caused by loss of income and erosion of savings, right? And that doesn't put us in a good position unless we are, um, unless we are, uh, you know, we play on the market. Uh, <laughs> the market keeps going up. But the, the real economy, uh, of course, is, is in, in a totally different state. Um, so, um, you know, we are kind of hostage to this uh, perverse mechanism, which continues to benefit uh, only the you know, 0.001%, um, who we could say are also the puppet masters, are also directing uh, operations, right? Uh, they're also controlling uh, everything else. And um, one way of looking at this is that we are um, uh, moving towards a new discourse, right? Which, is, which, which does not resemble the old capitalist discourse any longer, but uh, it's still a capitalist discourse, but looks more and more like a kind of soft dictatorship, as somebody's called it, right? A kind of soft dictatorship. We, uh, you know, whatever looks like democracy is increasingly only the other side of some kind of direct, more or less direct authoritarian control. And this is almost like a signifying chain, right? That leads to direct authoritarianism under the semblance of um, democracy, uh, of the old liberal democracy, right? And we can think of it in terms of COVID to start with. Then we got the vaccine mandates. Then we get digital health passports which are related to COVID and the vaccines, right? Um, then we get digital IDs next, which, which might become uh, obligatory, mandatory. And then eventually, some people say, right? Quite a lot of people argue that now, we will get uh, CBDCs, right? So central bank digital currency, fundamentally. So the plan could well be which won't necessarily succeed, right? I'm not saying this is going to happen. Right? This is probably a plan. This is something that is it, it's, it's, it's been planned. 
um, is that um, is, is to go from COVID to, to, to central bank digital currency, possibly after a major financial crash, right? Which would make the solution of uh, digital money controlled by uh, central banks um, almost inevitable, right? Uh, to save us from from disaster, right? That that would be the only way to save us from disaster. Essentially, a kind of monetary slavery, right? Which nevertheless would save us from something worse, right? So another emergency there. Uh, this would seem to imply, uh, as I said earlier, the phasing out of free market capitalism and the start of something darker, a kind of high tech feudalism. We could say we could think of it in terms of kind of high tech Middle Ages, right? Um, and and you know I think I think this is where the capitalist discourse, as Lacan understood it in the sixties and seventies, is taking us, right? And 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 it's it's not necessarily taking us because there's some evil guy, uh, a la Bill Gates, who wants to take us there, but it's kind of going there by inertia. Um, my, my argument would be that it's getting there by evolutionary inertia, right? It's just evolving and kind of in a kind of Darwinian sense, surviving, but to survive. It has to get there. It has to become more uh, authoritarian. Uh, the, you know, this would be my argument. And I think this started not necessarily with COVID, but much earlier, when, especially when uh, um, with with um, automation, with technological automation, which has started uh, destroying labor. Um, so eliminating more labor than it could reabsorb, especially with in the eighties with um, with with. Um, uh, the third industrial revolution, digitization, um, you know, microelectronics. Uh, all of a sudden, we saw a kind of jump, a spike, uh, where more labor was what was being made redundant than reabsorbed. And machines were used more and more. But of course, that 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 process, which is blind and anonymous, right? As as the capitalist discourse, blind and anonymous, um, implies also that capitalism shoots itself on the foot because. Uh, on the one hand, individual businesses can become, can make more profit through technological innovation, but the mass of value created diminishes, right? Decreases precisely because less and less labor is engaged, less and less wages are paid, and therefore there's, 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 there's a kind of fall in the mass of profits being made. So less and less value is created, which explains why. Um, why the the financial industry has grown exponentially in the last few decades, right? So so massively, because it needs to compensate for the lack of surplus value, the lack of value created in the real economy. So you know, it's a much more complex argument. That's what I'm trying to say. That it's it's not just that the COVID started all this, but it began much earlier, and it's part of I, what I would call a kind of an evolutionary evolutionary trajectory that sees. Uh, capitalism evolving and not necessarily evolving in a in a nice way. So, um, are we today then heading uh, towards a sort of um, a return to a traditional form of mastery? Right. This would be a question that we could discuss. Right. Are, are we seeing a return to a traditional form of mastery, to a traditional discourse of the master, as Lacan intended it? You know, when we see footage from Australia or from other parts of the world, uh, when we think about the kind of blackmail and the, and the coercion that is, that is, that's been going on recently, one thinks that maybe we are, right? There's a, there's a new master emerging here. Uh, some people have mentioned uh, Hobbes and, and, and the figure of the Leviathan, right, returning. But I think it's not necessarily like that. I think the best way to capture our discourse today is uh, by referring to a phrase that Lacan uses in Seminar 17, which is the curious copulation, copulation, right, of capitalism with modern science, right? Lacan uses this really nice um, phrase, copulation between capitalism with modern science. So in a sense, um, you know, uh, this kind of scientific authority that we're in, right, it seems to be what is driving the current discourse, what is kind of helping capitalism to refashioning itself beyond, beyond the obsolete 
liberal democratic order that it's leaving behind beyond the uh, kind of consumer utopia, the full employment utopia that we know it's not coming back, right? I think, I, at least I think I know that it's not coming back. <laughs> um, so, so we get, what kind of authority do we get? Who's driving this? And obviously we get the scientific discourse, which has the authority it has, right? The real science, the follow the science uh, messages that we're bombarded with all the time. Now, in respect of science, I can't argue that there are two sciences, right? Two types of science. There's the intrinsically authoritarian scientism um, that originates directly in positivism, which I would say today, a lot of it corresponds to what we are sold as, 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 as the real science, right? Almost like a new religion in that respect, right? And there is the science that, uh, uh, whose fundamental premise uh, is that it must doubt and it must question everything. Right? And I think that's the other science that Lacan refers to. Almost like hysterical, hysterically questioning everything. Uh, almost like neurotically. There's a kind of neurotic dimension to science that Lacan um, often emphasizes. Right? So for Lacan, modern science is deeply ambiguous. On the one hand, it consists of questions that always invoke new questions, which makes it a discourse emphatically based on what it lacks. So it always lacks knowledge and it looks for new knowledge, right? But there is also a darker side, you know? There is the science that attempts, Lacan is very explicit on this as well, uh, to remove the very reference to lack uh, uh, of, of that, that, that pertains to every, to every discourse by imposing uh, the positivist dogma of the universal calculability and quantification of reality, right? So, um, and Lacan stated again and again that this sort of scientific delusion implies precisely a violent removal uh, or foreclosure, the kind of souterrage, as he calls it, of the subject of the unconscious, right? So the elimination, not even the elimination, the kind of a priori elimination, foreclosure of the unconscious. And, um, you know, there's a quotation from 1974, uh, Lacan interviewed in 1974 by an Italian newspaper. He says, science is in the process of substituting itself for religion. And it is even more despotic, obtuse, and obscurantist than religion, right? And I think that we're now at a stage where, in a sense, capitalism uh, is kind of banking on the power of this science, uh, of this science that is sold to us as real science just as much as it capitalizes on health, right? Which is now probably the most profitable business in the world, especially after COVID, you know? And I, I think we need to be uh, very wary and, and, and you know, of, of this kind of, as Lacan calls it, a uh, curious copulation, right? Between capital and science. Because maybe that this is what is driving um, the new capitalist discourse, right? As it evolves into something else, into another, form of capitalism, which maybe is based on, 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 on a different form of authority. So, you know, the, the, the problem is once again, the problem of the cause, the, 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 you know, the, the psychoanalytic problem of the cause. Um, uh, you know, Lacan makes the point that, that of course, the cause is, um, the cause as truth, right, in psychoanalysis is something that uh, stumbles, that uh, doesn't work. Hmm? Not something that works, something that doesn't work. That is the cause as truth. Il n'y a de cause que de ce qui cloche. There is no cause unless something stumbles. Uh, only something that stumbles is cause of something, right? So the problem that we seem to be facing is that, that, that we don't see that cause any longer, right? Everything seems to work. Everything seems to work uh, despite its madness. Um, and nobody questions it. Um, everybody seems to be engaged in denying, in asking any serious real questions about, about this, this thing that is working, right? That is, that is not, not working. Um, and, um, and here is where the, this final uh, uh, notion of uh, successful paranoia, right? That Lacan brings in. Uh, in, in, uh, again, in uh, Science and Truth, I think makes, makes uh, sense. So, uh, 
you know, Lacan, just to, to, to finish, Lacan proposed that the, the, the suturing of the subject operated by modern science in copulation, in its copulation with capital, corresponds fundamentally to the foreclosing of the name of the father, right? So what is rejected without possibility of symbolic returns is the master signifier, the signifier of symbolic castration that oversees the process of elementary abstraction on which any subjective or social identity is based. This is what modern science, science seems to be doing. So here then the deadlock of scientific knowledge is linked by Lacan to the structure of psychosis, right? Uh, more precisely, the scientific discourse for Lacan would seem to, to give rise to a paranoid type of subjectivity, insofar as paranoid psychosis is based on the delusional image of a consistent subject who projects the perception of its own uncastrated structure into the field of the other. Here, however, comes an interesting twist, right? And this is where the notion of successful paranoia comes in. Alluding to a Freudian uh, aphorism, Lacan in Science and Truth uh, argues that modern science perhaps could be compared to a case of successful paranoia. Why successful paranoia? Because the name of the father is foreclosed, so rejected a priori, right? So the subject of the unconscious is excluded. And yet, and yet, the scientific discourse seems to function, right? As it did, it did function with COVID. So we can perhaps argue that our epoch, you know, insofar as it is overdetermined by the capitalist signifier in conjunction with the scientific signifier, uh, somehow does manage to hypnotize us insofar as we continue to believe in the consistency and utility of the corporate owned scientific knowledge, which is sold to us as real science, right? Which is, however, as the history of science demonstrates, by definition, a locus of delusion and error. And it should be seen, you know, as a locus of delusion and error, because that's what science does. It, you know, it, it proceeds by mistakes, right? It, it doubts, um, it's never certain about what it does, and so on and so forth. So. Ultimately, however, despite uh, the convergence of, uh, of capital and science and modern science with, with this kind of ideal of a kind of uncastrated truth, right, to emerge, Lacan also suggests in Science and Truth that um, since psychoanalysis is essentially what brings the name of the father back into scientific examination, science's successful paranoia is bound to be exposed as a lie, right? It's, it's bound to fail somehow. Um, for Lacan, of course, modern science remains at heart uh, a drive, so fueled by its doubts, fueled by its frustrations, deeply um, fueled by its deeply unsatisfactory knowledge and its discoveries. And so maybe at this level, science remains uh, irreducible to the kind of manipulation that I think we're seeing often today in relation to, um, to COVID, right? Um, so I, I'm gonna stop there and then maybe we can discuss this further. Um, I have some more things to say about the economy, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep them maybe for the discussion later on. That's brilliant. Thank you, Fabio. Sorry, just took me a minute for my unmute button there. Fabio, I'm just gonna kick things off with a very quick question. So picking up on one of the, the, the tail end of your yeah. Your presentation there. Um, when you're talking about this idea of the, I mean, I mean first of all, you, you paint a, a very powerful and um, and quite pessimistic yeah. vision of the future, um, but you you end on a you know a positive note in a sense. Mm. But you say you know, the the lie of science will be exposed. The, the inevitability that this will the lie will be exposed, and. I guess I have two interrelated questions. My first question, simple question is, exposed to whom? You know, if something is going to be exposed, there has to be someone yeah. there to um, to witness that exposure. And going back to Lacan's discourses, if we if we think of the discourse of the master, what under what sits under the master um, 
in the way Lacan pitches the discourse is the subject. So the subject is in the position of truth when um, the master is in the position of agency. And one way we might understand that is that any, any domain of mastery is always reliant on some kind of subjective endorsement that without the subject or the collective subjectivity of any era um, supporting the master, the master's mastery um, is un unmaintainable. And I wonder, and you know, I guess I'm going to preface this with an apology for being pessimistic against your the optimism with which you end. But I wonder one thing the discourse of COVID has done is disrupted the possibility of that um, that hysterical position that the subject as the subject um, no longer supports the master, the su subject moves into the, the position of agency and we have the hysteric position, but that position has arguably been dismantled or um, rendered impossible in advance by the structure, the social structures that we've seen emerge, or the discourses we've seen emerge, um, in, in terms of COVID and the, the attendant discourses around pandemics, lockdowns, and yeah, you know, science, you know, everything mm. you're talking about. That, and it's actually become impossible in advance to question the authority, whether that be the the political authority, the economic authority, or the scientific authority. If you question that, you're automatically put in the camp of of the conspiracists, the, the mad people, the people who are, are simply crazy and not following these these very sensible rules, which is to, um, you know, almost to castrate the, to castrate any opposition before that opposition has a chance to to emerge. Um, so yeah. I guess to kind of go back to try and put this in terms of a question, but I guess I'm saying is how. How realistic is the optimistic position that you I'm, you I'm, not, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm only optimistic because I'm I'm kind of optimistic if you want to call it like that. I don't think you know optimism and pessimism. I'm not sure whether I can endorse either. You know, it's 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 just that it's it's just this idea of the unconscious that 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 springs from um, from Lacan that I think um, gives me optimism in in so far as I can say that. He, you know, in order to properly foreclose uh, and therefore um, eliminate, if you like, a priori, right, the subject of the unconscious, which is the source of resistance, ultimately, right? Do we agree on that? That, that, that the subject of the unconscious, insofar as it doesn't know, <laughs> is the source of resistance, right? Insofar as there is something that, that is missing, that is lacking in, in there, it's, it's what creates uh, uh, some sort of resistance to the uniformity of the narrative, etc. Right? Um, it's something that, for Lacan, I think you, you you simply cannot eliminate. In order to eliminate the subject of the unconscious, you've got to get rid of humanity as such. Right? You've got to eliminate the whole of humanity um, from 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 Earth. And maybe we're getting there. Right? Maybe that's where we're, we're heading to. <laughs> maybe we're going towards this sort of catastrophe. But insofar as, as as human beings are there, I think uh, the the project of creating this successful paranoia, right, which I think has to do with this cooperation, this alliance, this um, today at least with this a strong alliance and 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 copulation, as the camp puts it nicely. Now, the question there would be: Is there a sexual relationship between capital and science, right? But uh, okay, apart from that, I would say. Uh, uh, you know, this project is bound to fail because the subject of the unconscious um, cannot be fully eliminated. Um, and I'm not talking just about, you know, in the kind of master and slave situation that you are referring to, it's, it's not just the slaves or those who are under the master and the mastery that, that uh, have to have recourse to the, the subject of the unconscious to resist, but it's something that also has to do with mastery, right? So th th my point here would be that, that uh, whoever is driving this uh, agenda, whoever is driving this propaganda, uh, this massive uh, series of lies that we've seen recently, I think I've seen anyway, um, I don't want to speak for everybody, but uh, they also are confused. They also are not sure about what they're doing. They haven't got a clue 
how to get out of this mess, right? I think this is what I've kind of realized by looking at the, at the economy argument. They don't have a clue. You know, they are just tentatively moving, tentatively trying to find a solution, but they don't really have a plan B for the reason that I've exposed. Uh, uh, because they are caught in this kind of deadlock, you know, the, the, in this kind of catch-22. Uh, you know, whichever move they make, they get it wrong. Unless something completely new emerges, I think, right? Unless a new discourse somehow is created. And in that respect, I have, I have little doubt that sooner or later it will emerge, a new discourse. My only problem, my only pessimism comes from the fact that it could be that for a while we won't see it, right? Because we are, we are still being um, hypnotized, right? We haven't, we haven't yet come out of this hypnosis, I think, which I was referring to at the start of the, of the talk. Um, but yeah, my optimism, going back to, what, to your question, has to do simply with the fact that I believe fundamentally in one thing, that, that there is such a thing as, as a subject of the unconscious that will um, disturb right, and resist to any long-term attempt to control, manipulate uh, and uh, the people uh, completely. So that's, that's the only hope I have, really. Does that in, in any way sort of answer your question? Like I'm, I'm, I'm holding on to the subject of the unconscious here, right? I'm holding on to that subject that I know is still there and that in order to get rid of it, you need to get rid of humanity, I think, right? Once you got rid of humanity, you've also got rid of the subject of the unconscious. But until then, there is hope. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a but brilliant. In, in, in terms of strategies, it's a different matter, right? I'm not talking politically or um, like I wouldn't know where to begin. Well, I mean, that was kind of going to be my next question, but I'm not going to ask a next question because yeah. I'm very conscious about hogging the floor here. And I think right. um, there are other people in our audience who, who do have questions. Um, but I, I think the question of is a very important one, but possibly also a much bigger one than we can accommodate this evening. Um, but maybe one we need to pick up later. But can I open things up to the floor? Has anyone else got um, questions or areas they'd like to take the discussion into? Kieran. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the talk. Um, just a short question. I'm just wondering, I didn't quite catch whether um, Fabio was suggesting that COVID was like, the short way of saying it is that capitalism always, it thrives on crises. Its crises are always its opportunities. But I was wondering, were you suggesting that um, a crisis came along and was used as an opportunity mm. or a crisis was engineered. And I yeah. think there's a big kind of difference there because it's like, oh, what, you're, are you, I don't think you are suggesting that somehow this virus was engineered. It was like, there was like a level of planning there. Um, well, it's you know, a crisis from the other point of view of like, say, a left point of view of like the, the crisis is also an opportunity from the other way around, perhaps as well. I guess maybe you were alluding to that too. So it's just a short question. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And I think that, um, you know, it's at the heart of what I'm saying in many ways. Now, we need to think about, um, yes, crisis opportunities. Um, if COVID, you know, came about as it did in at the start of 2020, after the collapse or near collapse really or the, the really close you know close shave in terms of a collapse in the financial sector in September 2019 then we can say that they were very lucky the coincidence was incredible right because it came at the right time just as now we see the the the, the, the called variants coming at the right time to prolong the money printing Right, because that's what variants are doing fundamentally, right? They are allowing the central banks to postpone what they call tapering. So to postpone the, the, um, um, the slowing down fundamentally of the, the, the monetary um, uh, stimulus, right? So uh, if, if, you, if you look at what uh, Jerome Powell is doing in, in, in with the Fed, is, is buying time. He's announcing tapering, but he's not doing it. Right? He's saying, okay, we'll start reducing the money printing. We'll, we'll start turning off the money printer in December. This is what, what we're waiting for. Everybody's waiting for this tapering, right? 
but he cannot do it. He knows that he cannot do it. He simply cannot do it, otherwise there would be chaos. Inflation will go up, you know. He cannot even afford to raise interest rates by, to 2%, right? Because that would cause uh, chaos as well, right? Uh, in the lending, uh, in, in, the, in the borrowing markets, etc. cetera. Um, so th that's what I'm saying that, okay, going back to your question, I think, I, unfortunately, I, I'd have to say that a level of planning was involved, right, from my angle. Um, I'm not sure how. I, don't, I haven't got the evidence. I haven't got any evidence. I, I really don't know. But they, okay, if the crisis, if the, if, if the, if the, uh, the virus came accidentally, then they did an excellent job at using it and at using it very quickly. They had everything ready, right? They, had, they did an, an event called Event 201 in October. 2019, where they planned they, they, the event, they kind of planned exactly, they described, they simulated, sorry, they simulated exactly what was going, what happened uh, a couple of months later. Exactly. So maybe it's just a coincidence, right? Maybe it's just a coincidence that everything fell into the right place and then they kind of used the crisis, they used COVID in order to um, inflate the financials, to sort out the financial sector and close down the economy in order to sort out the financial sector. Or maybe, or maybe some people say that it's a matter of diagnostic reclassification, for example, right? Sort of rebranding the virus. You give it, it's a virus, it's a flu virus, you give it a specific name and you start creating chaos. Um, you know, the, 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 there are people who are uh, you know, we're talking about um, mass psychology here, right? We are a behavioral psychologists to know exactly what to do in order to create chaos and to create fear, to, you know, the fear mongering, using a virus in order to create something much bigger. T to me, this uh, suspicious disproportion between the reaction to COVID and COVID, right? The reaction to the virus and virus. The reaction is, it's been incredible. The use of medieval methods, right, to the, like lockdowns, etc., to, to combat the virus is something that is, to me, very suspicious. Um, and again, we go back to what I was saying earlier about conspiracy theories. Um, power conspires. It's always conspired, you know, since the very beginning, since Roman times or earlier. Uh, conspiracies have always been part of, of, of holding power and keeping power. And, and, and Lacan, with Lacan's perspective, you can see that it's even easier to conspire in a sense because power is invisible and it's intangible. Nobody sees where it is. Nobody knows where it is exactly, right? It's somewhere around us, but it's intangible. So that secrecy makes it even more likely that, that power is able to conspire and to do things that, you know, to manipulate us psychologically, to um, hypnotize us, if you like, and to make us believe things that are not necessarily true. So that's that would be my answer, but of course I haven't got any evidence, right? It's, it's maybe we'll never know. Maybe we'll find out in in hundred years. Does yeah, that answer your question, Kieran? Yes. Uh, thanks very much, Fabio. No, no problem. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Kieran. Thank you. Any other questions from the from the floor? While we're waiting for other people to engage, Fabio, just um on the back of your answer to, to Kieran. Yeah. It, it strikes me that the question of, of, you know, whether what the truth is behind the, mm. you know, was the, you know, accepting your argument that's, you know, which I, I think is a very, very cogent and very persuasive argument that the, the, the capitalist machine has, has benefited enormously from this and the, the social situation we're seeing now um, is very much shaped by, um, as I hesitate to say the word decision, but is shaped by movements of that machine. And it strikes me as well that the, the question, was this coincidental? Was it mm -hmm. accidental? Was it, um, was it planned and structured? Is almost a distraction to what's going on because we don't know. You know, the fact is, you know, People claim they have evidence in one direction, and people um, claim they have you know, good grounds for suspicion in another direction, and it just becomes a distraction to the real question of what is happening. Um, and we start to, to get involved in this 
unanswerable question of what happened mm. in the lab in in Wuhan in in 2019. Yeah. And we will probably, you know, I'm guessing here, but I would say we'll probably never know the answers to those mm. things. So it's, it's a distraction to the real question of what is happening to society. It almost doesn't matter yeah. what, the, what the origin was. I, I agree with you. I, I, from my point of view, I'm not too bothered by that, whether it's lab or not lab. Or For me, the fundamental question is the connection between an imploding economy, right, an economy, a kind of a kind of liberal democratic, if a liberal capitalism that is imploding for historical reasons, as I, you know, I, I said by inertia almost, it's kind of going, you know, it's 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 it's, it's um, shrinking. The mass of value created by labor is shrinking, and that's a fact, right? That's real, and that has to do with uh, with uh, I think it has to do fundamentally with uh, the, the you know the growing automation of production and the elimination of labor. Um, and, and to me, the fundamental issue has to do with connecting that implosion, that shrinking of the economy with the potentiation of the financial sector, which is one way to compensate for the loss of value in the, in the real economy, as it were, right, in the old economy as we know it. And, and that financial sector, um, you know, the mad dance of the, fi of the financial system uh, going beyond madness, we're talking about something which is crazy, right? And uh, and 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 what we're seeing is that those who are um, controlling uh, the financial system, or those who are controlling, those who are really occupying positions of power, uh, are ready to do whatever to make sure that they retain their privileges on the one hand, but also that the system that they are, uh, you know, uh, uh, attached to continues in, in one way or another. So my, my point here is that we shouldn't be surprised, right, that in the next months, something, uh, something equally um, dramatic, uh, traumatic, uh, like a new emergency. Uh, we're faced by a new emergency because I, don't, I really don't see a way out of this. If we follow the logic of capitalism and the logic of the financial system, there isn't a way out of this mess, right? Unless we continue with emergencies, which which keep the 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 the, the, the people on the ground, transactions on the ground, you know, everything that takes place under control in some kind of frozen state. The moment you reopen, everything explodes because the, the economy cannot sustain that any longer. Too much money in the financial sector, and um, and 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 you know. If people want to hang on to the financial sector as it is, then they need emergencies. They need virus. They need aliens. They need um, uh, Iran. Uh, you know the, the atomic explosion. They need a war in 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 Southeast Asia. Uh, they need volcanoes. They need tsunamis. They need something that <laughs> that 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 looks like a global emergency of huge traction, like COVID. Right. I think this to me is clear. This is something that I think. I think my problem with, with the left is that it has refused this argument, right? It has completely kind of buried the head in the sand in relation to, to this argument that has to do with the, the, you know, the cap capitalism trying to survive by becoming more authoritarian. So in, in my problem with, with like, like even with Zizek, right, and, and, uh, is, is that it kind of accepts um, the naive, in a kind of naive way, right? That that um, that that this has little to do with with uh, with with capitalism as a as a system that is imploding, right? And I think that's where I, yeah, where I, I lost friends over this, you know. <laughs> I believe that's part of the I way. I made new friends, but I lost others, right? Yeah, well, I'm glad you're making friends. <laughs> I made new friends. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> Um, I'm just gonna go. I've got more questions for you, but I'm gonna go to the the chat here. Um... Hi, 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 hey! Thank you so much for this event, uh, Fabio, Calm, no everybody. This is, um, you know, as somebody uh, who has also um, lost friends and family <laughs> over, this, um, and feeling in lots of ways like I'm not the crazy one. I'm just pointing out 
actual stats and, and logic, and it doesn't seem like anyone is willing to engage because there's this narrative that is so all-consuming. But um, I just appreciate this very well-balanced um, and logical and, and data-backed kind of analysis here. Um, I have kind of two related questions. One is, um, given that these power structures are kind of moving in this way to enact these larger plans, it seems like, you know, they probably realize that, you know, a lot of the fear mongering against, for instance, the unvaccinated is, is not necessarily warranted. Do you see that part of the plan to kind of create this two tier society to exclude a segment of the population that won't comply is, um, you know, just meant to distract or is it actually part of keeping that lid on consumerism when even as you reopen, you're reopening with a chunk of the population that can't work or can't consume. Um, and then kind of second to that is, um, you know, I know you had said you don't really know kind of a solution here, but is a solution that we can prepare ourselves by, you know, is it, is it buying cryptocurrency or Bitcoin? Is it, uh, you know, creating freedom cell, you know, um, collective communities where we're trading amongst ourselves? What, what is the best against defensive strategy to, even if we can't stop these machinations, how can we best kind of prepare ourselves or our families to, you know, benefit, you know, aside from just avoiding the brunt of the damage? Um, thank you so much. Good questions, really good question and difficult ones, right? Very difficult thank questions. Thank uh, uh, the, I think they are trying to do, I think from what I've heard from, um, um, for example, Italy, in Italy and France, places like that, um, the vaccination um, is divisive, is creating a two-tier society. It's, um, um, you know, elimin kind of uh, excluding people, creating a kind of apartheid uh, uh, in, within society, right? Uh, um, uh, but I, I still think that it's a kind of tentative move, right? I, I, I think maybe if they're trying something at that level is aimed at digitizing our identities, right? So vaccine, which we know that now that they don't really work because they create there's more and more variants and you know they, they you know this isn't a way in which science cannot be sh shut up you know the, the, there are ways in which science tells the truth right it's, it's we know that um, but um, I think vaccine vaccinations is aimed at creating the COVID pass digital pass and that digital pass then will be linked to digital IDs. Uh, and eventually, the plan they, they stated they stated very clearly. If you if you read um, Schwab's books, right, he says it quite clearly that the aim, or, or even if you listen to uh, um, Larry Fink, you know the the, the guy from uh, BlackRock uh, or others, they say very clearly that, uh, that ultimately they want um, uh, central bank digital currencies, uh, uh, you know, linked to our digital IDs, so that they know everything about us, right? What we do with the money, they can turn it off and on if we don't behave, you know, a kind of cre a social credit system like in China, they, they're already trying, right? So I think, I think they are explicitly moving in that direction. And I think, and I think in, that, in that respect, I think the, the resistance against this COVID pass business, this green pass in Europe business is crucial, right? It's crucial to at least delay that, that uh, uh, aim that they have, right, to 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 create this digital um, society with kind of monetary slavery. Um, so that's that's ultimately, I think, what, what they are trying to implement, right? That's what they are, it's on their mind. Uh, I don't think they will necessarily make it, but they're trying, right? And that's what I was saying earlier. They they they're not necessarily so powerful to be able to do everything. They are also very tentative in the way they're moving. I think they don't really have a long-term plan necessarily, apart from, yes, relating our identities to uh, digital IDs, but uh, you know, they know that it's, it's not necessarily you know, uh, coming off. And the other question, um, I really don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know about um, Bitcoins and, and things like that, you know, where there, a lot of people are obviously investing in gold and cryptocurrencies uh, to prepare themselves for the devaluation to come, right? Or, you know, if you look at Bill Gates, he's buying land, he's buying land everywhere. And it's, 
So the, the thing to do would be to buy land if you, got the, if you have the money, right? To invest in something solid, physical. Uh, gold would be the other one. But ultimately, I don't think that would, you know, if, if the real disaster happens, I'm not sure that will, will save anybody. You know, uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't. I think it's more important to look at ways of 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 preventing this this um, bomb, right, from exploding. The bomb is sticking away in the financial system. We know that. If, if something happens in the financial system, you know, it will make 2008 look like a walk in the park. As I said earlier, it will be a huge explosion. It will. It will destroy our, you know, everything we have. We won't have money in the cash points when we go to the cash points. We won't have, um, you know, our, our savings will be destroyed, you know, if we have any savings. And uh, it's chaos, right? And then from that, you can see uh, civil wars. You can see the worst of humanity, you know, emerging. So it's a matter of diffusing that bomb, taking away in the financial sector uh, whilst thinking, of a different way of living together, ultimately, right? Organizing politically a different movement that 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 uh, can make human beings living according to a different discourse, uh, which is not the one that we're following blindly now, like lemmings, um, which is taking us really to a bad place, I think, right? Ultimately, so yeah, I don't think I've got uh, <laughs> much more to say in that respect. It's it's being aware of it. Being critical of it and being aware of it, being prepared even somehow, right, for, for something that might happen in two or three months or in two or three years is already something. Uh, it helps us creating a different kind of um, relation with other people around us, I think. In my case, you know, it changes the way I see other people, it changes the way I relate to other people. The moment I know that there's another way of living rather than, 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 than this mad uh, rat race that is kind of taking us over the cliff, you know? Um, so that's what I can say. Awareness is crucial, right? Critical thinking, critical awareness is crucial. Sorry, Dave, if I wasn't particularly exhaustive, but... Mm, brilliant. Um, thanks, Fabio, and thanks, Dave. Um, I was going to move on to the other question. We've got some questions coming up now, so... Um, Mina. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Hi. Just um, talking about the conspiracy uh, theory, um, I have one because um, I don't understand something. And um, when, when I follow the virus, something doesn't make sense to me because um, like Iran was one of the first countries that was hit really hard by the virus. And, then, and before it actually reached um, Italy and then Europe. So... I thought maybe you have an, like something to say about this or. Well, that's a big question. And, and I, um, yeah. And I, I, and I would like to also add that like um, Iran could be um, considered a very good example of this um, successful paranoia, like mm. um, how the leader talks and everything about the virus. And um, like since the revolution, it's exactly mm. A very good example. There's a lot of places where um, I think the virus has been used. Um, like I think of Cuba, for example. In Cuba, there's, there's been like draconian measures. I know that because my sister lives there. And, uh, and she, she tells me that there are incredible measures when there's no need for them at all. There's the, you know, the, the people in hospitals and whatever. They, they use them really literally to control the population there. And to, you know. So there's many, many ways in which I think COVID has been used, right? Apart from this, I think, uh, overarching narrative of financial implosion and COVID used precisely to um, sort out the mess in the financial system, as it were. Um, but there's so much, for me, I don't want to get now necessarily into discussing the medical side of it because I'm not an expert. What I can say is that since more or less the beginning, for me, there were so many contradictions about the spreading of this virus that I suffered. I just couldn't believe that we were all believing everything that they were, t they were telling us about it, right? Uh, to me, the most obvious contradiction, just to say something very, very quickly, is got to do with um, the, the PCR test, right? The PCR test is something very ambiguous. It's used in a very, very um, uh, ambiguous way. It's about 
it's about cycle thresholds. Um, if, if, if you listen to what the inventor of the PCR test had to say about it, unfortunately, he died in August 2019. But, you know, uh, he said you can pick up almost anything with the PCR test. So old detritus of old viruses that have stayed with you but are totally harmless, you can pick them up and you can turn them into a virus if you want to. So it's an incredible inst tool for manipulation, right? You can rebrand almost everything you have inside you, even if you're absolutely fine. And this notion of asymptomatic carrier of the spreader of the virus, again, is something extremely suspicious in medical terms. Uh, what I found extremely, again, worrying is the way in which the real science has banned for so many months, right? Any kind of debate no debate were allowed, right? On the, almost through a kind of moral blackmail, right? If you doubt this, you're inhuman, you're evil, uh, you're a conspiracy theorist, or almost along the axis of some kind of political polarization, the left-right left polarization, which is totally false, right? It's imposed. It's, again, another ideological... Uh, so if, if, you're, if you're doubting this, you're, you're with Trump or or you're a right-winger, or, or, or worse, right? It doesn't stop. Um, so all these strategies are telling me that there is something really fishy about the way in which uh, this agenda, agenda has been imposed. Yes, I was also struck by the way the virus jumped, right? It jumped from China to Iran, then Italy, uh, hitting certain countries than others. But uh, like, for example, uh, around China, for a long time, there was no virus, you know, Taiwan and things like that. There was no, no real reports of it. But in Iran, there were a lot of people dying. And, and in Italy, there was all of a sudden lots of people dying of COVID, right? Um, I was also struck, for example, by images. That this is probably the first time I really realized that there was something wrong. Uh, when I saw this footage from China that people were literally falling in the street, like dying of COVID, but literally falling in the street. And I thought, wait a, wait a second, I never saw anybody dying of COVID like in the street, like all of a sudden being hit by COVID as it sort of shot by a, a gun, you know, uh, somewhere. And yet we were uh, believing these images, right? And which were clearly, I think... Um, um, uh, a, a cinema, right? Sort of actors playing their role. There's what there's an incredibly good one. Maybe you can still find it where somebody is is is, is filmed falling down, uh, apparently because he was dying of COVID in the street, but putting his hands forward in order to protect himself from falling. Right. So that to me is acting. In in it's act is an actor who's a bad actor as well. We should have got a better stuntman, you know, to do that. But that that uh, immediately said, okay. So why do you, why do they need that? Why do they need to create all this fear in us? Why? And then you ask questions, and then you you, you come back to the for me to the economic cause. There's there's an economic driver behind it that imposes this fear, and in order to to block the economy, to create lockdowns, you know, turning off the engine so that you can repair turning off the car so that you can repair the engine or, you know, that sort of metaphor I think works. But the jumping around of the virus also, I, I found it incredibly suspicious. Um, I think there's a lot of, like a lot of rebranding that has been going on with, with this SARS-CoV-2 virus. A lot of, a lot of reclassification, you know, other things. We know that the count, you know, is, is, was inflated. We know that yeah, we know a lot of things. I don't want to get into that because it's a long list and I don't think it's appropriate to talk about it here. But there's a lot of literature everywhere, really, if, if we want to see. If we really want to see, we can find it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thanks for your question. I'm trying to stop myself from talking about things that I know would put me in a... Yeah, no, not, not at all, Fabio. Um, I think we've got time for one last question. I think Alex, you wanted to ask a question. So I think we take. you've been very patient with us, so... Um, we're a little bit over time, but I think we can take one last question and then we'll move to the other platform. Alex. Alex. Hi. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfectly. Hi, Fabio. Hi. Nice to meet you, finally. Um, we yeah. know each other. We know each other, by the way. 
I was one of the people who wrote you because, first of all, thanks for the Philosophical Saloon essay. I think it was great. Um, I think you were very courageous and it was really on time. Someone does the economic work, which I am totally impotent to do. So I was happy someone kind of jump in, <laughs> in, in, in the gap of my super ego to, to say that uh, publicly with all the consequences that your desire will have for you. <laughs> and... Um, Second thing, uh, I mean, I don't want to go too much into the economic side, and I have a problem with how you use the notion of discourse a bit, but this would go too long for today in a Lacanian sense. But you had a nice paradox in your own narrative. On the one side, you say it's an evolutionary structure, um, blind flow of capitalism in the self-assess. You, you said the word evolutionary like two or three times. And on the other side, you kind of are very critical of the, of the critique that you said kind of there is a big other that planned it and so on. So you say, okay, maybe it's an accident that the virus jumped in perfectly in time after the simulation and, and so on was done. But you kind of say too many things show there is too much planning inside. And I like this paradox because, of course, it's both truth in a way. And you also say now even, they don't know what they do. They say December, but what will be in December? So what I said once in my text was, uh, on the one side, the strategy is kind of eliminating um, contingency, like planning and planning our life until the end, eliminating unconscious subject, whatever. But on the same time, this is a total failure. In, it, it, it fails all the time. They cannot plan it. And there jumps in my question like, okay, there is no big other, but we are responsible for the frame of our fantasy for the window. Um, could you say something on, on maybe also the singular part, the responsibility? I think this is maybe a missing link between this big other and mm. what is our part in that <laughs> also? And the failure that comes with this paradox you have in your own narrative. Maybe you can say one or two last uh, comments on that. Yes, I think you've answered my question, the question almost when you told me that I'm responsible for my desires and I maybe pay the consequences for it, right? So at a singular level, I'm paying the consequences for it, I'm sure. Sooner or later it will hit me. Um, like, you know, I'm not saying that I'm doing anything exceptional, but I'm simply saying what I, I, I've been wanting to say for a long time. And I've been kind of faithful to my desire in that respect, right? I've, I've, I've been, I haven't given up on my desire to use the Lacanian uh, phrase. And um, on a singular level, rather than saying, okay, uh, I'll, I'll stop doing this because it makes life easier. Um, there's a number of things I could say around it, like you know, my friends or whatever. You keep doing it because because you cannot not do it, right? It's something that you feel like it's, it's stronger than you. You've got to look into this and if there's some truth there, you think it's, it's, a, it's your own truth, obviously, but you need to pursue it. And, and regardless of what it takes you, and it might take you some, somewhere unpleasant, but at least you're, 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 you're satisfying your drive, as it were, rather than desire, right? You're, you're, you're sticking with your jouissance. So, okay, I don't want to get too involved into this but uh, yeah, on a singular level, that's I think all, all you can do, right? And, and, and uh, be responsible for your desire, as it were, or for your... Um, um, the other question was about uh, the big other and the... Um, remind me, sorry, the big other. No, that in your own narrative, there is mm. a paradox. Yeah. You say on the one side, it's an evolutionary process of the capitalist discourse. But yeah. on the other side, we are spoken by a discourse. Yes, there is yes, no yes. objective yeah, yeah. world. Yeah. We are spoken by a discourse. And it runs so well. But at the same time, it fails all the time. This planning machinery, because you kind of say there have been simulations even of this crisis yeah. scenarios. And it serves the excess and self-excess of capitalism. But at the same time, it's totally evolutionary. So could mm. you say something on your own paradox here? I think it's, I, I, I think it's, it, 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 it fails on a, on a kind of superficial level. It kind of works, you know? We, 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 what we are seeing is that it actually works. And that's where the notion of, of successful paranoia comes from. It's successful. It does work. Um, despite the fact that there are inconsistencies that are so obvious that everybody can see, right? I think we all can see the inconsistencies. 
I think if, if we stop and, and, and think for five minutes, we know that there is something really weird about all this, right? Very fishy about, about the whole situation. And yet it works. And yet we, and, and here subject and other are two sides of the same coin, right? We are part of the same discourse. We are inserted in the same narrative. We are part of this evolutionary uh, uh, um, adjustment of, uh, of the capitalist discourse that is kind of get going there. And, and it's not like somebody's pushing in, in that direction. Yes, yeah, some people obviously are, but it's, it's more like the whole way in which um, our, our own uh, being part of this discourse develops, you know, we are all in it together. It's not as if I, I, I never, you know, uh, pull myself out of the reality I look at. I'm always inside the reality I look at, right? That's the fundamental subjective act that you are, you don't, you don't think that you are a privileged uh, onlooker, that you are outside the, the reality you look at. You are inside, you're part of the same, you share even the desires of everybody. You too, or to a certain, to a certain extent, don't really want to know much, you know? The greatest passion of the human being is not wanting to know ultimately, that's what the, the ignorance of the human being, right? Like Khan said, and I think, yes, we are all like that too, right? Because we have our own desires, which are capitalist desires. We have our own way of living, which is a capitalist way of living. We have our commodities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are involved in in this discourse, and we are rolling with it, right? We are part of this evolutionary, revolution, evolutionary change. Um, that's why it's difficult to find moments uh, of resistance, right? To 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 locate. Uh, 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 to situate places and, and, and moments where there can be some sort of resistance to this. Because the inconsistency is obvious. The inco the, the, that it is inconsistent is obvious, but we kind of pretend that, it's, that it works, right? And therefore it works. <laughs> because if we pretend that it works, it's like the financial system. If you pretend that it works, there is money there. But as a matter of fact, there isn't much money. It's just a Ponzi scheme. Right? It's, it's a fake Ponzi scheme. But insofar as we believe in it, so far as then that's fine. So, um, yeah, I think, I think one crucial uh, advantage we have is that those in power really are making a very clumsy. They're making mistakes after mistakes after mistake. And I, I think that they are also desperately now, desperate, desperately looking for a new emergency. I think the next emergency will be even more crucial than COVID in many ways, right? Let's get prepared for the next one because the next one, <laughs> um, you know, will be very similar, very similar to this in, in terms of how it manipulates us. But maybe on the back of what we have got from COVID, we will be able to resist the manipulation because, you know, it will, it will, it will come. Um, I'm very pessimistic about about what's happening in the financial system, really pessimistic, right? They really need to to find uh, um, to find a, a, a way uh, to continue with the current um, uh, strategy of uh, money printing and zero interest rates and uh, debt financing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they can only do it through emergencies. So that's that's. Being prepared for that is already being a step ahead, right? I think, sorry. Sorry, Alex, maybe I didn't answer your question, but maybe it needs more time to think about it. And yeah. um, Fabio, I'm gonna have to draw things to a close here because we've kind of run out of time. Thank you so much for this evening. It's been a, you know, it was a fantastic and, and very lucid, clear talk, but also the generosity with which you received the questions and um, you know, followed the, the line of thinking of the questions. Um, it's been an absolute delight to thank host you. Me. Thank you so much. And I thank do you for reminding me. I appreciate it. No, thank you. And thank you to the audience for being so engaged. Um, you know, this, these events are always about the audience. So um, thank you for being there. I also, just to kind of, um, as, before we finish this part, last bit on the, the kind of more formal side, we have, for those of you who have not attended Lacan in Scotland events before, we run on the final Thursday of every month. So please sign up at our website and you'll get notification. Our next talk is on um, the last Thursday of October. Um, it's um, Brett Firmani, who's um, 
the author of this book. So um, he will be talking um, around the ideas in the book. The book is Psychosis and Extreme States. It's a fantastic book and um, I'm expecting it to be a fantastic talk. So please do join us then. Um, but for tonight, thank you to Fabi Fabiana, Fabio. Um, absolutely brilliant talk, Fabio. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. See you shortly. See you in a bit. Yeah.